All right, so now that we've talked a little bit about animal behavior, we're going to move on into just general ecology. So this is kind of a bit of a primer chapter. So I don't want you to get too bogged down in the nitty gritty details of this chapter. So that's really why I think that you should focus more on the lecture uh, than what your book has to say, just because the book will cover so much more information than you really need. So in order to really know all the information from chapter 52 that you need for the AP test, you need to know the role of abiotic factors in the formation of what we call biomes, and we'll get to that. You need to know what freshwater and marine biomes kind of look like. So you need to be familiar with what those look like. And you need to know some major terrestrial biomes and their characteristics. You don't need to memorize a ton of this stuff. You just need to have like overall feel for what the climate might look like in those biomes and also just be able to, given some data, place a particular ecosystem into a particular biome. Uh, so ecology is basically the scientific study of interactions between organisms and their environment. So it's basically how individuals interact and how individuals also interact with their environment. Okay. So it's pretty broad and it's working at like a system level. It's really challenging to do ecological research because you're looking at a huge system with lots of moving parts. So ecology necessitates looking at the biotic and the abiotic influences of an ecosystem or of a system because you need to look at both the living and the non-living parts in order to understand how they interact with one another. So just to kind of clarify, biotic bio, right, means living. So it's any of the organisms in the areas, and it could be their behaviors. It could be, you know, the fact that they eat one another. It could be anything. Anything living is a biotic factor. Anything abiotic would be a non-living factor. So this could be the temperature of the area. This could be salinity. So that's how salty an area is. It could be how much water there is, sunlight, soil, etc. So when we're looking at ecology, we really need to think about this as a large system. And because it's such a large system, what we've done is we've kind of broken up that system into subsystems. So if we were to look at the smallest area, we could look at individual organisms. Okay? So we could look at their behaviors. right? And so we did that a little bit in chapter 51. It was animal behavior, right? But really, behavioral ecology is its own study. It's basically how an organism's behaviors impact other organisms and the, and the uh, environment. Okay. So we can start at the organism level. We've already done that. Then we can zoom out a little and start talking about populations. So now that's multiple individuals. And they're always going to be of the same species to be considered a population. And they live in the same region. Now... The region might change, so like some organisms will migrate or maybe they just, you know, they're nomadic, uh, they just move regularly. Um, so the, the area might change, but that's just because the population as a whole is moving. It's still a population, even if they move together. Uh, then if you zoom out again, you have communities. And so communities are when populations start interacting. So populations are the same species. Okay. And then communities are multiple species. Okay. So for instance, if you were to think about dogs, you could have a population of dogs, right? And then if they're interacting with humans, now you have a community because you had two populations. You had a population of dogs and a population of humans, and now they're interacting in some way. That is now a community. Okay. Then if you zoom out again, you get to the ecosystem level. So this is the major level that we are going to cover. So as we go through the next few chapters, we're going to be going into each of these. We've already done organisms through behavior. Okay? And then we're going to go populations. Then we're going to go to communities. And then we're going to go to ecosystems. So we're going to see all of these in more detail. But the ecosystem is basically the community plus any of the physical or abiotic factors in that area. Then if you zoom out even more, you have a landscape. So landscape ecology focuses on those ecosystems being connected because in reality, no ecosystem is completely isolated. And then if you zoom out even further from landscape, you start to get to the biosphere, which is like overall global ecosystem because everything that's happening inside of an ecosystem has an impact on every other ecosystem, basically. Because if you are adding carbon dioxide, guess what? you're affecting the ecosystem of the world. So the biosphere. Okay. 
So if we were to just assign images to kind of get our brains to think about this, we start with organismal ecology. So that's the individual, their behavior, et cetera. Then we zoom out to populations. All of those individuals are of the same species. Then if you look at multiple populations, we're looking at a community. Then if you look at a community plus any of the abiotic factors, then you have an ecosystem. If you look at lots of different ecosystems, you have a landscape and we have lots of different landscapes. You have a global ecology. Okay. So because we're talking about such large systems, we really need to clarify what climate is because there's a lot of misconceptions about what climate is. It's gotten better in recent years in terms of people understanding exactly what it means, which is good, but it still has a lot of issues. So climate is going to be long term, and that is the key term there, long term prevailing weather conditions of a particular area. So the climate of an area doesn't just encompass what it feels like today. Uh, so you can't say, oh, it's cold outside today or it's raining outside today. So global warming isn't a thing. Climate change is fake. Like that's not how climate works. You look at global data across entire years and we can see that, oh yeah, over the entire year, it does in fact increase on average every year. Okay. So climate is not just temperature. It's also precipitation, it's sunlight, it's wind, it's pretty much any major excuse me, abiotic factor of an area added up together. Okay. And we have these two different delineations of climate. We have a macroclimate versus a microclimate. So a macroclimate is basically looking at a seasonal, regional, or local level, whereas the microclimate is looking at a much smaller scale, basically like a what is the climate of an area for a small insect is often what microclimate will be used for so like what is the area under the log because there's going to be a lot more humidity or amount of water under a log in a tropical rainforest than up at the top of the tree probably right so you need to start thinking about an organism and how it interacts with the environment and just how large its environment truly is to know whether you should be thinking about the macroclimate or the microclimate. <coughs> Excuse me. So climate change has had huge impacts on almost every living organism um, that we have seen recently. And we are seeing that organisms have to shift their ranges in order to accommodate. So like birds are now at risk because mosquitoes, which carry avian flu, okay, so avian flu, so bird flu, basically, can now go higher up. So birds used to be safe at certain altitudes because those mosquitoes couldn't reach them because it was too cold. Now, those mosquitoes can go higher because it's warmer and they're reaching those birds and it's wiping out a ton of bird populations. Like in Hawaii, for, ex for instance, the uh, Hawaiian honey creepers are really, really going downhill right now in no small part due to that climate change. So when we start talking about patterns, we really need to think about the globe because depending on where you are in the globe, you get different amounts of sunlight, right? And I don't need you to memorize this. That's not the point of AP Bio. This is more of like an AP environmental science topic. It is important for biology, but this is more of the ultimate cause and we can use usually more of the proximate cause, right? And the proximate effects. So with sunlight intensity, basically, if you're near the equator or at the equator, you're going to get the most sun, right? That's why those areas are tropical. That's why they're so hot. Uh, if you are right around 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, you're going to see a lot of deserts at those areas. And there's some really interesting reasons for why. There's like Hadley cells and all this stuff. It's super cool. And I wish we could talk about it, but there's just not the time and it's not the focus of AP Biology. Uh, and then as you go further north or further south, so basically as you get away from the equator, so the center, as you get away, uh, speaking of when we're talking about latitude, not longitude, so longitude would be vertical. Okay? We're looking at horizontal. All right. So as you move away and you go towards the poles, temperatures get more extreme, right? So there's less sun, and so there's more variation in temperature. And that's going to become really important when we start talking about like polar areas. Okay. So basically, this is why we see those deserts there. This is why we see so many different um, patterns in global climate, depending on where you are, according to latitude. 
basically air moves in particular ways. The sun hits the air here, and then that warms the air, causing it to rise, and then it all rises, and it eventually hits the outer atmosphere, and then that causes it to kind of push up against a wall here and then start spreading. And then as it goes this way, it's going to start to cool. As it starts to cool, it's going to go down, etc. So it's a really complicated process, and it's really fascinating. And it's all about density and temperature, so stuff that you might have learned before, and it's the really cool applications of it, but you don't need to know how this works. All I really care about is that you are able to know what latitude is, what, where the equator is, and why like 30 degrees north and south matter. That's pretty much it. I don't need you to know wind patterns or anything like that. Okay. But just like the atmosphere and the wind has certain patterns, the ocean has currents. And so they have these different gyres. So those are basically like big old areas of the ocean where large circulations happen. And so there are currents happening in the ocean that move around like crazy. And I don't need you to memorize this either. Just know that there's a lot of interaction between systems here. That's really the whole point of ecology and really the whole point of chapter 52 as an introduction to ecology is to get you used to the idea of everything interacting with everything. If you change one thing in this system, everything is affected. Okay. And so, for instance, you can start to see huge climate effects if you have a mountain where there wasn't a mountain, you know, a million years ago, because air will basically come from the ocean towards the land. Right. And it does that because of temperature. Don't worry about it. But air will do that. It'll go up the mountain. Okay. Because it's getting pushed from the air behind it. So all this air coming behind it is pushing it. And that is going to cause the air to rise. As it rises, it cools. As the air cools, it can't hold water very well. And so we get a ton of rain on this side of a mountain. Okay. on the uh, the side from which the air is coming. Okay. And so we call that, well, we call the opposite side the leeward side. Okay. You don't need to know wayward side. But basically the air will go up the mountain. It adiabatically cools. It gets cooler because it's going up in altitude. That causes it to lose its water. And so on the other side, we have less water. And so the air is going to go over. And it's going to eventually go over, and that's great. Now this area has air, but we don't have any water. And so this is why you're going to see deserts on the leeward side of mountains, basically the side where the air is going, because it loses all its water right here. This is called the rain shadow effect. Okay, I don't need you to know the mechanisms of it. I'm mainly just showing you this because it's important to think about how one ecosystem may be very, very different. So this area is getting lots of rain here, lots of wind here. And then just nearby, just on the other side of the mountains, because these guys are getting so much rain, these guys get basically no water. So you can just think about uh, the Sierra Nevada mountains, right? So the east side of California has mountains and air is coming from the Pacific Ocean area and it's going and then it hits the Sierra Nevada. It rises and then once it reaches past the sierra nevada you reach nevada what do you know about nevada well it's a gigantic desert okay so is arizona for the same reason okay basically anything just immediately east of the sierra nevada is pretty dang desert-esque and that's because all the water was lost right here okay so i don't need you to memorize this. I just want you to kind of start thinking about the world around you. You can notice patterns. You will notice that canyons will have more plants on one side than another. And that's going to be cut be due to that rain shadow effect. And so you can explain why this side of a canyon has way more rain than this side okay? or way more plants. And therefore, you know, that's where all the rain goes. Right. And it's all because of how wind moves. So I don't need you to memorize the rain shadow effect. I just want you thinking about how systems interact. Okay? So when we start talking about ecosystems, it's going to be important that you're familiar with a few biomes. So these are basically just major types of ecosystems. Here are a bunch down here. I don't need you to memorize all of these. I would say that the important ones would be tropical forests, which you're probably familiar with. Okay? Savannah. So that would be like 
desert. They're different, but for our purposes, they can effectively be the same. Okay, so savanna or desert. And you should know tundra. Okay, so it's a pretty dry, uh, usually pretty cold area. Okay, so those are the big three that I need you to know. So desert, tropical forest, and tundra. Just be familiar with those in case the AP test starts talking about an area and they use those terms. You don't need to know like chaparral or anything. As interesting as all of these other biomes are, it's just not within the context of this course that important. Okay. Um, and so basically we talked about this a little bit, but where you are in the world and its climate and its elevation, so how high its altitude is, um, determine what biome you're going to have because if you change the temperature and you change the precipitation, so how much water there is, you're going to get different conditions. So if you have basically no precipitation, no rain, no snow, right, and you have high temperatures, you're going to be over here. You're far left on the mean precipitation because there's very little, and there's a temperature on the y-axis. So if you have high temperature, you're up here. So this is going to be a desert. Okay. And so this is not a chart that I need you to memorize. It's mainly one I want you to look at and be able to read. So this is a climograph. It's basically just showing temperature and precipitation on a graph. And then you can figure out what kind of a biome it is if you were given data. So if I was to give you the mean precipitation of an area and the mean temperature and this graph, you should be able to tell me what kind of a biome it is. Okay. Here are just some images of some biomes just to give you an idea of what they look like. Tropical rainforests are going to be right around the equator, like I mentioned before, right? So it's all going to be towards the center altitudes, or excuse me, latitudes. Um, deserts are going to be right around that 30 degrees north, 30 degrees south. So here's a map of all of the deserts in the world. Okay, well, almost all of the deserts in the world. Okay. Uh, savannah is going to have more grasslands. So it's, it's almost desert-esque. Right. And so that's why I said we can kind of lump them together, but there's more grass. Right. It's it's not quite as barren as a desert is. There is some water, just not as much as you know, a tropical rainforest, for instance. Chaparral is basically just a coastal scrubland. You don't need to know that one. Um, we have some of it in California and it looks great. Uh, I went to school near some of it. There's tons of cool wildlife there, but it's just not that important for this course. Temperate grassland looks an awful lot like a savanna, except it's a little bit more temperate, so it's a little bit further towards the poles, generally. Northern coniferous forests, temperate broadleaf forests. Tundras are very dry, right? And they're typically quite cold because they're very far north. Uh, that's one of the important ones that I told you about. Then, obviously, there's stuff like lakes, wetlands, streams, rivers, estuaries. So estuaries are basically where salt water meets fresh water, right? Basically where the ocean meets, you know, a lake or a river or something like that. Um, and so there's just tons of different wildlife in each of these biomes. And just to get you thinking about like small scale biomes, so it gets you thinking, oh, hey, the climate matters at a small scale as well. You can also think about intertidal zones. These things these areas get different levels of salinity, different levels of temperature changes. Um, and so all of that stuff becomes really important for the organisms there. And we may ignore it because like, you know, a beach feels like a beach to us, but if you're one meter away on this little beach area, it might be very, very different. And then we have a pelagic zone. So this is just open ocean. Um, and so this is going to be, pretty important when we talk about marine biology, but not super, super uh, covered in the scope of the AP bio class, unfortunately. Coral reefs, on the other hand, are super important. They're obviously underwater, and there's tons of biodiversity here. So if we're ruining our cor coral reefs, which we are, uh, then we are going to ruin a lot of biodiversity, and that is important for lots of reasons, and we're going to get into that when we hopefully, if there's time, get to chapter 56. Um, benthic zones are basically like at the bottom of the ocean. And basically the reason I'm showing you all of these biomes is because we start to think about biomes in terms of geography and what kind of life they can sustain. Okay. So when we talk about this term biogeography, it's basically the geographic distribution of species. It's where species live and why. And so factors might be dispersal of the species. So like how easily... Uh, they can move from where they started. It could be their behavior. It could be 
that there are some biotic factors that allow organisms to live there or don't allow organisms to live there. It could include some abiotic factors, so temperature, water, oxygen, salinity, the same stuff we saw before when I first introduced ecosystems. And then all of these things will basically impact where a species can end up. Okay. And so ranges will change if conditions change. So the blue here is the range of this butterfly in 1970. And the purple, <clears throat> excuse me, is where that range expanded into because temperatures started to change and, you know, other conditions started to change. And so I just want you thinking about how changing a system affects the members of that system. That's really what ecology is all about. And so as much as I would love to have you memorize biomes so that we could talk about each one and the impacts we're having on them, there's just no time for that. And so we're going to instead focus on changing a system and the impacts it has on the players within those systems.